cosmic conflict. The world that God created perfect now afflicts us with misfortune and chaos. But through Jesus Christ, we have overcome the world and the powers of darkness. Family, I invite you to take in this moment, to quiet yourself for just a second. We live in a world full of distractions, and it seems like anytime we're, we're ready and willing to do something for God, it seems like distractions just pop up, seemingly out of the blue, right? But no, family, I wanna remind you that we are in the midst of a battle. We are in a spiritual war. And I wanna encourage you as we go through this series to really study along with us, read along with every speaker that presents uh, a sermon because it is a reminder to us of the seriousness of the life that we live in. As a matter of fact, I want you to look around and just take a look as the service goes on, the series goes on. Look at the chaos, look at the turmoil, look at things seemingly out of place. Well, family, at times, that is our lives. But I want to encourage you that through Jesus Christ, we have already become and are victorious. So let's go to worship. Remember to like, share, subscribe. Remember to hit the notification bell so that you're notified the moment we go live. Um, other than that, family, hey, let's get it. Let's just worship them together. It's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the light.
this place of submission where we find peace. This place of submission where we find healing. It's this place of submission where we find deliverance. changed
Father, we thank you for this time of worship. Father, we thank you that we can boldly approach your throne and that we can come into your presence. Lord, we can come into your presence and lay at your feet. We can make our petitions known. We can just come into your presence to worship. And Father, we thank you for these opportunities. We never take them for granted. Lord, that we can trust you, we can call on you, and we can expect more. Father, mercy, we bless you this morning. We bring you worship, honor, reverence, our focus, our attention. We thank you for, for calling us out of darkness into the light. We thank you for choosing us and equipping us for your purpose. God, may our hearts, our minds be attentive in this moment as we are strengthened in your word May we go from glory to glory as your ambassadors in the earth. May we be awakened, God, to what you have called us to do in the here and in the now. May our souls respond with a yes and an amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So one day there was a woman who bought this very, very expensive dress. And... She's in the store with the dress and trying it on, and she loved it, got home and told her husband that she had bought this dress, and her husband found out how much she had spent on the dress, and he lost it. He said, babe, like, what's good? I thought we had just talked about this. We were going to save our money because we wanted to go on a nice vacation, so we were not going to have any extra expenses. Why would you buy this expensive dress? The woman looked at her husband and said, hey, I tried, trust me, I tried. I tried really hard, but, but you don't understand. The devil made me do it. I tried it on and he said, girl, you looking good. We gonna, uh, we, you going to kill him in that one. That's the one right there. That's the one. The husband says, baby, baby, listen, listen, listen. 
all you had to do is say, Satan, get behind me. She said, I did, I did, that's exactly what I said. And he got behind me and said, oh, we, we're going to kill him in that one. That's the one right there. Uh, listen, if he, if he can't get you from the front, <laughs> listen, he's going to try to get you from the back. If he can't puff you up, he's going to try and put you down. But what I can promise you he's going to do, he's going to be relentless in his attack against you. Now, you may, you may be thinking, like, like, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> like, I'm just living my life. I'm just minding my own business. How did I get caught up in this situation where I have this, this enemy or I'm in this cosmic conflict as we've been talking about? The reason that he's coming after you is actually not as much about you. Ultimately, it's not about you. You're just collateral damage. Uh, so today we start this two-month series about this cosmic conflict called collateral damage. And our base passage is going to be Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Now, we're not going to cover all of those verses today. We're going to cover just the first three verses. So meet me in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And it reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength or the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul starts off this section here by saying, finally. Now, for us preachers, it's usually an indication that we're going to be preaching a little while longer, right? And such is the case here with Paul. He's also saying that after everything I've been saying to you, how I've been telling you how you should live your life, this here is the final application of everything that I've been instructing you in. He's writing here to the church of Ephesus. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background about Ephesus. This series is not going to be an expositional teaching like we've been doing uh, sometimes, but, but I do want to kind of set the stage by giving you a little context of what was happening in the city of Ephesus and why the Holy Spirit, the divine author, inspires the Apostle Paul to write this letter to this new church. Much like Detroit, Ephesus was a very religious city. It was a major port of the Roman Empire, and it centered its worship around the goddess Diana. She was the goddess of, of hunting and the goddess of fertility, and life in Ephesus largely revolved around worshiping her. Thousands of the temple priests would, would gather and would tend to the worshipers as, as the businessmen would come. And the artists would flock there. And they would, they would make, use their hands to make these idols and turn a crazy profit off of those who were looking to worship. When Paul gets on the scene, Paul preaches the gospel of Jesus. And it goes crazy. You can read about it in Acts chapter 19. The people listen and the people respond. Many people believed and placed their faith in Jesus. And even some of the artists and the sorcerers, after they believed, they actually took their magic books, they took their pagan tools, and they burned them. They were worth a fortune at the time. So this was a really, really big deal. When the temple priests and the businessmen saw what was happening and that too many people were converting to Jesus, they were not having it. They didn't like it. And, and what they ended up doing was they rose up against Paul. They rioted the city and against Paul's team. Paul ends up getting his stuff and moving on to the next missionary journey. But the church that stayed there would face conflict. Social conflict. 
governmental conflict, cultural and legal pressure to give in to this new or this established way of worshiping. They did not want to worship the way that Paul came preaching to them. So Paul wants to instruct the church how they should live, how they, how they should continue in the faith. You know, we have this beautiful picture in, in uh, Acts chapter 20. And the Apostle Paul, before he actually goes on in his journey, he's in this remote island called Miletus, and he calls for the elders of this church that he started, this church of Ephesus. He calls them to himself, and they're gathered there, and Paul tells them, you got to be ready. You must stay ready because, he says, wolves are coming. Wolves are coming after you. Wolves are coming after the body, after the church. And he says here, they're coming to devour you. And they're coming both from within and from without. Some of the wolves, he says, will be false teachers. They're going to look like they're one of you, but they're not of you. And, and he gives them this, this, in, this heartfelt intimate sense that he, he loves them, he's prepared them, and now they must go and do everything that they have been taught. Just a few years later, Paul is actually in Rome, and he's arrested, he's under house arrest for obeying God, and he begins to write this letter to the Ephesian church, the church of Ephesus, to check up on them and to remind them of who they are in God and how they should live as a result of them being in God, how they should stand firm against the godless influences of the city. And that is why we have the epistle of the Ephesians. This book reminds us of, of these three things. He reminds them and also he reminds us of these three things. One, who we are in Christ. Two, what we have received now that we are in Christ, blessings and immeasurable riches. And then three, how we are to live now that we're in Christ. You can split the book down actually in the middle. We won't necessarily, again, do an expositional teaching. We actually did that at the end of 2019. So go check that out on our podcast in a series called Church. But the first three chapters are, are more so indicative. They speak to what God has already done for believers, okay? What God has already done for you and for anyone who has placed faith in Jesus. The last three chapters speak to how believers are supposed to live now that they are in the faith. These are the imperatives. So first the indicatives, then the imperatives. One quick side note, in Scripture we always see the imperative following the indicative. We never see the imperative being first, all right? That's not how it works for the people of God. So despite the many blessings that come with following Jesus, Paul says, prepare for intense conflict. Expect it to be chaotic. Expect it to get intense. So for the rest of our time, we're going to take a mini inductive approach necessarily, not exhaustive, but this approach to this cosmic conflict as we look at these three verses and we answer the questions, who, what, where, why, and how. Who, what, where, why, and how. First question is the who. What, who, who is the, the who of the cosmic conflict? Now, I got to take a little bit of time on this one, y'all, so bear with me. The prevailing notion in broader culture of a devil or a demonic, personal, intelligent force is received kind of lighthearted today. It's received with skepticism or just total regard by and large. However, we continue to see movies or musical references or album cover art even that reveal this preoccupation with the spirit world of darkness. So, we have to ask, why this preoccupation with these things? Like, what, what's that all about? What is the interest behind it? Could it be that the very source of the preoccupation is an indication of the reality of the one about whom the culture seems to be enamored with? 
in November 1978, a long time ago, The Economist magazine ran an article under the heading, Is Satan Dead? Is Satan Dead? This article was released right after the James Jones uh, cult mass suicide uh, in Guyana, where this cult leader convinced all of his followers to, to drink poison and basically take all of their lives. Almost 1,000 people died, a third of them being children. Up until the 9-11 attacks, this was actually the, the largest single loss of American civilian life in our history. And the writer of this article here is, is expressing that a vacuum has been created by the increasing decline of the influence of Christianity. And, and with that vacuum, there's this, this longing. There's this this longing, this desire for something to take its place, for something to fulfill it. It's like the Russian philosopher Dostoevsky once said, when people cease to believe in God, they don't believe in nothing. They start to believe in everything. And he points out, the author here, that the influence of of Lenin and Stalin and and Marx and secular philosophy were actually starting to lose their appeal. And when that happens, something has to take its place. And when the quest for something takes place, you really don't know where it's going to end. And this explains why there's this, this, the, all these appalling things that are happening and in the, in these mass suicides that have just taken place. Then he says this, get this, perhaps there is worse to come. Y'all, this is 1978. Most of y'all weren't even born. <laughs> I was three years old. He says, what happened in Jonestown, Guyana, is a ghoulish cautionary tale for all these different people who in differing ways are seeking God in a secular world. In that search for God, it is all too easy to blunder into the arms of Satan himself. He ends this article by asking the question, is Satan not dead after all? For if Satan, in some sense, is not dead, that implies that God is not either. Yo, it's it's one thing for a secular world to, to like, come to this conclusion. It's one thing for for a secular people to have these thoughts. But what is tragically revealing is that within our, our framework of Christianity, the framework of the big C, the capital C church, very little is actually known about the devil. <sighs> Paul tells us that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against our neighbor, our spouse, the person that is sharing the road with us, with us maybe getting a little, bit, a little bit too over in our lane. It's not against our co-workers. It's not even against our own flesh and our propensity for sin or weakness. No. People are simply conduits of the spiritual battle that has actually taken place, get this, in another realm. As people of God, we have a dual citizenship. So yes, we are here in the physical, but what we represent and how we war comes from another place all together. The Word of God tells us that our battle against rulers of darkness, against powers, against principalities, against forces of wickedness is located in the heavenly places. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Right now we're just talking about The who? Satan and his team. He's not some impersonal force. He's not just some idea. It's not a negative thought. He's an intelligible person with personhood that is a deceiver. Scripture calls him the father of lies. 
Jesus instructed his disciples to pray this way. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or is it, as it may be equally translated, deliver us from the evil one. Uh, this is a prayer that Christians should pray. This is the disciples' prayer. When's the last time you prayed this? Deliver me from the evil one. My concern is we don't talk nearly enough about this world that very much so exists. That is more real than the world, the material world that we can connect with with our five senses. <sighs> Yo, in the Garden of Eden, the reason Satan took the form of a serpent is because he and his cohorts, his demons, operate best when there is a physical presence through which they can work. Hear this. Remember this. While spiritual warfare is being waged in the heavenly places, our enemy is extremely skilled at locating available opportunities in the physical realm so that he can influence, manipulate them, and deceive. That's why Paul tells us in the fourth chapter of Ephesians to give him no opportunity. His cohort, his, his, his team consists of these different attackers, demons, which are disembodied spirits, rulers of darkness, fear, jealousy, envy, I could go on, hate, those are all rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places powers, principalities. These principalities we see in the scriptures, they, they seem to, to rule over municipalities. So like physical territory, they seem to have some level of charge or dominion over. We'll get into some of this as the series goes along. Here's the thing. Satan and his cohorts, like they know what happened to you when you were a child. They know that thing that messed up your thinking, that lowered your self-esteem, that led to sin patterns that now may seem unbreakable in your life. Not only do they know, they're not just innocently obser innocent observers. No, they were behind it. They know about the issues and the abuse to you or from you. They know exactly how to come. They know which lies to throw your way. They know exactly how to tempt you. They know what frustrates you. They know what wears you down. And when they come at you, they're looking for any way in. They're looking for a word that's going to indicate that maybe you're not as much walking in faith. That's why worrying is so destructive to us as worshipers. You know that worrying actually worships the enemy? Worrying changes your focus and your gaze from being on him to being on your circumstance. They know exactly how to come at you and to exploit these weaknesses so that they can devour you. That's their purpose. That's their purpose. He's a crafty opponent. And unless we do battle against him correctly, I just got to be honest with you, we're going to lose. Unless you know how to do battle against him in the realm of the spirit, maybe you can have some temporary success in the physical, material realm. But unless we are equipped on doing battle in the spirit realm, it will not last. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 even tells us that he disguises himself as an angel of light. And he pursues his, his agenda to destroy us by intentionally penetrating four areas that we see consistently in the scriptures. Maybe not so ironically, these are also four areas that we see God wanting to display his glory through. These four areas are number one, the individual, the person. Number two, the family. The family consisting of the covenant of marriage, children, raising children up in the family. Number three, the church, 
Ephesians 3 tells us that the church is, is the, is, puts on display the, the multicolored wisdom of God for these principalities and powers to observe. Then number four, in the culture. He's, again, he's coming at the individual, the family, the church, and then in the culture. That's the who, Satan. The what, what is the, the what of this, of this co- cosmic conflict? It is the fact that we're in a war. We are at war. Verse 12 says again, For we do not wrestle or battle against flesh and blood or struggle against flesh and blood, but, but, there's the contrary preposition, we do battle, we do struggle, we do wrestle, we do fight. 2 Timothy 2, 3, Paul says, share in suffering as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Oh, oh, family, I ask you, are you entangled in civilian pursuit today? Or have you committed yourself? It's your, your aim to please the one who has enlisted you. 1 Peter 2.11, we just covered this a few weeks ago. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Family, this is not allegory. This is not literary symbolism. This battle is real. You know, if you're not a combat veteran, or maybe you haven't lived in a war-torn land, war may not seem very real to you. When you haven't felt the explosions or seen your, your, your wounded friend lying in blood at the doorstep of death, war can seem abstract, even distant. The war that we are in is like no other war that any of us have ever known or heard about or could even conceive with our natural minds. If you were to think about the worst absolute war in human history, it would pair in comparison to the spiritual battle that is being waged all around us. Get this, spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is the cosmic conflict waged in the invisible spiritual realm, simultaneously fleshed out in the visible physical realm. Huh. Immediately two dangers when it comes to this, to this war. One is that we can set it aside and almost functionally deny that it even exists and treat it as a metaphor or just treat it as being symbolic of life being difficult and presenting us with challenges. And in doing so, denying what the Bible actually teaches. Or, or we can be on the other end of that spectrum and we can be way too preoccupied with it. You know, there are some who think that it's actually their responsibility to call out everything the devil is doing and to identify everything as, as a spirit. The sound system has a spirit. The lights have a, has a spirit. The pizza man has a spirit. Just like <laughs> everything got a spirit. Now, I will acknowledge it's important for us to understand. One of the gifts of the Spirit that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is the, the gift of the discerning of spirits. It's not the spirit of discernment. It's the gift of the, the discerning of spirits. Right? You may hear heard someone say, oh, I have the gift of discernment. That's, that's a different gift, right? The gift that Paul is talking about is are those who actually have this, this spiritual sense, as it were, when they have a, a, an understanding or revelation that there are spirits in the room. Sometimes those who operate in that gift actually see the spirits, good or bad. Whether it's demonic or whether it is there are angels, they see it. Hmm. The root of this war, family, if I could put it very plain and simple to you, the root of this war is something that we cannot see visibly. 
but the effects of the war are clearly seen and felt. They're felt in our bodies. They're felt in our minds. They're felt in our wallets. They're felt in our neighborhoods. They're felt in the brokenness and the abandonment that we see all around us. They're felt in the, the, the pursuit, the endless pursuit of finding, wanting to find peace and being constantly frustrated. They are definitely felt. You ever been in a place where you, you have everything you need but nothing you want? I've been through that place. Been there. I want you to know that behind every physical disturbance, every setback, every ailment or issue that you may face lies a spiritual root. And unless we can first identify and deal with the root spiritual cause, get this, our attempts to fix it can only provide temporary relief. <laughs> you can't come to, 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 a, to a gunfight with a sword. Right? You can't expect to, to do well and to battle well in, in, this, in this realm that is not in the material. You ever wake up and just like feel heavy? You ever like have this sense that, that, man, something is going on. I can't put my finger on it. Listen, you're in a war. Now, maybe it was the pizza you ate last night. Maybe. I don't know. But perhaps, perhaps it could be this, this sense that, that there is something that is beneath the surface that is coming at you, coming against you. You know, even since I've been preparing for this series, I've, I've sensed an increase in the spiritual intensity around me, the spiritual warfare, perhaps it's the actual attack, perhaps it's my awareness of it, I don't know. But my, 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 my sense is that I, I, can, I can feel it a lot more heavier. I don't take that for granted. You ever just find yourself like on edge, like for no reason? Like for no like natural, emotional even Reason, and maybe you say something out the way and you don't really mean to say that don't really, doesn't really reflect or represent your heart. And instead of, instead of like apologizing to the person, you just ride with it. <laughs> you just double down and just like, you know. <laughs> you know you should have apologized immediately. There's something at work. I can, I can relate to that. I've been in that situation with my wife and others. But let me just make something really, really clear. When I, when I act in that kind of way, it's all my doing. Please hear this. It's all my doing. We're not saying like the, like the young woman who bought the dress, the devil made me do it. No. Every time that I sin, I sin. Every sin is an inside job. The enemy can tip you. He can throw all kinds of things at you, right? But you have to make a decision whether you are going to obey or not obey. In the world in which we live in, as, as followers of Christ, as believers in Jesus, there is this dark, demonic, spiritual, intelligent force that is constantly seeking to undermine the people of God, to destabilize, and to cause absolute chaos. Chaos within your marriage, chaos within your family, chaos among your job, chaos among the people of God, your church, chaos in the culture, chaos in your mind. You ever suffer with an unquiet mind? He's the accuser of the brethren and the sister. He comes to insinuate. He likes to plant thoughts that will have you second-guessing yourself and everyone around you. You know your life ain't going nowhere. You know, they don't really value you like they should. If they did, they would support you. You're going to get stuck in that same trash position, for, on that same trash job, and have a trash career to go with that trash life. You're approaching 30, single, no prospects. You ain't going to never find no one. He loves to plant these seeds and insinuate. Well, having a child is going to disrupt my whole life. No thank you. I'm good. Plus, why would anybody want to even bring a child into 
to this awful godless world, I'm straight. He's constantly coming at us. And then he'll bring condemnation to you for even having those thoughts start up. <laughs> this is what he does. The conflict, hear this. The conflict that we find ourselves in is not a denial of our faith. It's evidence of it. It's evidence of it. I've had those thoughts. I could be in the middle of worshiping, and I could have those thoughts. Then he'll come at me with the condemnation, like, how, how, what, what, what is wrong with you? You call yourself a pastor. How can you even have those thoughts? You call yourself a Christian. Ha! You're a joke. You're a joke. And I'm like, I don't even know where those thoughts came from. I was just listening to Math City, man. I was, what happened? <laughs> Maybe he was just, you know, watching TBN or, you know, jamming out to never would have, never could have made it. I don't know. But there's a force at work. You didn't just conjure it up. You maybe you're thinking like it came out of nowhere, like a fiery dart. That's exactly what it is, a fiery dart, because you're in a war. It highlights a problem that we often run into. We keep trying to fix things in the physical realm by using physical methods. <sighs> the physical world is not where our problems originate. This takes us to the next question in our induct inductive study here, these three verses. The where. The where. Again, let's go back to the be beginning of this chapter very briefly, the beginning of this book, where Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, power pack first 12 or so verses, yo. We'll just read verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. There it is. Heavenly places simply means the spiritual realm. So, now get this. First off, what we learn from this right here is that everything that God is going to ever do for us, he's already done. Sit with that for a minute. Every blessing that God is ever going to bless you with, he's already done it. I remember growing up, this be this song on the radio. God is not through. God is not through blessing you. You can sing that if you want to. But the word of God is clear. <laughs> he's already blessed us. We have the fullness of that blessing Already, that's on period, family. You got to understand that and grasp that. Every spiritual blessing is located in this unseen realm. And every promise that God has ever made and plans to fulfill on your behalf, every gift that you will ever receive, and every hope that will ever be satisfied has already been deposited into your spiritual account in the spiritual realm. Glory to God. Where you are physically is not the only place that you are located is what that means. You have a natural location, but you also have a location that fine friends can't follow you at. Sorry to my Android folk. This, this GPS don't, this GPS can't find you on this realm. Ah. Paul tells us that at the moment that you trusted in Christ for your salvation, you were immediately transported to another realm. And what Paul is making clear here in Ephesians 6 is that that is the realm in which this great spiritual battle is being fought. That's the realm. The physical realm simply manifests what is already happening in the spiritual realm. You know, we're in a realm, we're in a war where ground zero is located in heavenly places. <sighs> Paul is saying, our blessings are in the heavenly places. Jesus is in the heavenly places. We are seated in heavenly places. That speaks to our authority. Angels are in the heavenly places. And then we see this satanic realm. Also in the heavenly places. 
Now, what's, what's up with the angels? We, I don't have time to go get super, super deep here, but a couple things I just want to throw at you. Number one, one of the words for God <laughs> is Elohim. It means the Lord of hosts, which also means and refers to the God of the army of angels. He's also called El Gabor, which means the God of war. And here these angels, uh, they've been assigned to us and specifically been assigned to you. And their job is to go up against the satanic forces that are attacking you. That's their job. Do you know that every Christian has at least one angel who has been assigned to operate on your behalf in the spiritual realm? Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 tells us, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? (laughs) So you actually have someone who knows and understands the spirit realm better than you, whose job it is to do battle in a realm in a way that benefits you and fights on your behalf. Psalm 91 tells us he's given his angels charge over us. Here's the thing, the scriptures tell us that they respond or they hearken to the voice of God's word. You got to know the word. Ah. Next, the why. What is the why of this cosmic conflict? The origin. How in the world did we get here? The history of this battle began when God made the first move. By creating the angels. Lucifer, the anointed cherub, the scriptures call him, responds by rebelling against God and taking one third of the angels with him in that rebellion. Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Where did he fall? He fell to earth. God countered that rebellion by creating man. In his own image, a little lower than the angels. Hmm. Satan, not one to sit back, counters by enticing Adam and Eve, misrepresenting God, deceiving them, thus turning over earth from them to his control. Does God sit back? No. God counters Satan's move by providing a redemptive covering for Adam and Eve and putting in motion their total redemption and restoration. Ah. When he says to him that the, the, the seed of the woman will be your defeat, basically. The seed of the woman is going to come and she's going to bruise the head of the serpent, although the serpent is going to bruise his heel. So here we have a bruise to a heel and a bruise to a head. One of those is fatal. But can you imagine Lucifer, Satan now in the earth realm, not knowing what is this seed of the woman? Seed of the woman? What? Can you imagine him waiting? Is, that, is, is he the one? Is he the one that's going to destroy me and bruise my head? Is he the one? So what he does, he immediately, he immediately attacks Cain and incites this this family struggle between these two brothers where Cain has jealousy wound up in his heart and eventually kills Abel in order to cut off the godly lineage. Ah, but God responds to Satan's move through the birth of Seth, Abel's little brother. And the Bible says in Genesis 4, 26, that he made a way for men to begin calling upon the name of the Lord again. Ah, Satan counters that move by luring Nimrod at the Tower of Babel into thinking that he can actually build a tower up to God himself way high into the, to ver- the very heavens where God is. Uh, God encounters or re- reacts by taking a man, a pagan man, and making him his own. A pagan man named Abram, he changes his name to Abraham and tells him that he's going to be blessed and that through him there's going to be a nation that arise. Not only will there be many nations, but one nation specifically that would be holy and set apart to God himself. 
Ah, the plot thickens. <laughs> so Satan then moves to, to trap this new nation in Egypt under Pharaoh's rule. Ah, but then God raises up a deliverer named Moses and places him in a position to free his people and set them on their journey. And throughout the remainder of the Old Testament, we see this move, counter move, move, counter move, move, counter move, like a classic chess game. Both sides sit in silence for 400 years, but there is no recorded move until we see God reach for a special piece. <laughs> His own son, Jesus the Christ, and he moves him to a new location from heaven to earth. And Satan tries to encounter God's move by tempting Jesus. First he tries to kill him as a baby, then he tries to tempt Jesus, then he causes the religious rulers to rise up against him. And what he thinks is the last move, the last final checkmate, where he thinks he's orchestrating Jesus' death and crucifixion, but he actually miscalculates the whole thing. He didn't understand that Jesus said, you can go ahead and destroy this temple if you want to, but in three days I'm going to raise it up. <laughs> so he takes it upon himself, the curse of our sin, and becomes our collateral damage. <sighs> and in three days, just like he said, he defeats the final enemy, death, securing our victory. Glory to God. Ah. Uh, so while we are still here on earth, family, while the ball is still in play, the board is still active, so to speak, we live in light of this truth. We live in light of this victory. The victory that, that Jesus won, that he gained through that final move, the resurrection, empowered by the Spirit of God. And that same Spirit indwells you today, right here, right now. Ah. Uh, because of that decisive move, Satan has no authority over you. He has no control over you. His only means is to deceive you. His only means is to overcome you by lying to you. Oh, but that leads us to our last and final piece to this cosmic conflict, the how. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this one. We're going to get into it next week. You don't want to miss next week. But the how... What is the how of the cosmic conflict? We know the who is Satan. The what is this, this battle that is being waged? It is being waged where? In the heavenly places. But the how, how do we fight? We stand. Paul tells us four times in, the, in this passage here that you must stand. You got to realize this, this key principle, if you're going to stand the way he's called you to stand, that we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. So when he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Whoa, 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 whoa. back up, back up, back up. Be strong where? In the Lord. Now, let me just say this before I finish this. I think it's the King James Version that says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Where is our power? Like, where is the power of the church? Like, we don't talk about that enough. A couple years ago, I shared something that the Holy Spirit began to challenge me on have I become a functional cessationist, not really tapping into the reservoir and the, spirit, the spiritual weaponry that God had made available? And we just are looking at things naturally, trying to respond to them naturally. There's power that God has given us. There's delegated authority that he has released to his son, Jesus, and Jesus has given them to us through his spirit. And the way, the only way that we can stand and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might is by recognizing that we are in him. 
Uh, hear this, the most vital thing that you can understand in this spiritual war is that, you, is that your union with Christ means everything. You are united with Christ. That's why Paul says over and over and over again in those first 12 verses of this book, in Christ, with Christ, in Christ, with Christ, this speaks to our position. And it is through that, family, and only through that, that we can stand. Hear this. This is the utmost important factor of your engagement in battle. Now, we're talking about today this cosmic conflict, focusing more so on the struggle. The next few, all of the rest of the weeks are going to talk about the strategy. But before we get into the strategy, I want you to understand the struggle and how in this struggle we are to stand. It is only a life lived in union with Christ that qualifies us, enables us, and empowers us to deal with this conflict. So as I close, I want to ask you, where are you in this fight? Where are you in this battle? Where are you currently, like how are you currently engaged in war? Are you still mapping out your strategy? Are you in the midst of it, hunkered down in a foxhole? Are you engaged in combat regularly? Or are you wounded in action? Fighting with a limp? Blood in your eyes, not seeing clearly? Perhaps you're in basic training and still figuring out, still trying to understand the nature of the battle. Perhaps you're just trying not to think about it. Perhaps you're back in the barracks, relaxing, chilling. Maybe you're on a mission to rescue the POWs. I hope you're not AWOL. Completely missing in action. Separated from your platoon. Separated from those who you've been enlisted in the army with. My next question for you. As we look at our world as we look at the pain, as we look at the brokenness all around us, what examples can we look at as clear evidence of a spiritual battle taking place in another realm? Hmm. Hmm. Then lastly, when in your life have you been most aware? Where in your life are you the most aware of the reality of spiritual warfare, and how are you warring against it? The next eight weeks, we'll get into the strategy here. i leave you with this. Paul tells young Pastor Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 12, to fight the good fight of faith and take hold of the eternal life to which you have been called. I invite you in this moment to respond to El Gabor, the God of war, who has already declared your victory, who has already paved the way for you to be reconciled back to him. I implore you to respond. Father, I pray right now, both for those who are in the faith, those who are on the fence, and those who are far from you, God, that we would have our hearts awakened to what you have called us to live out as your warriors, that we will be engaged not just in the physical but in the spiritual realm, that we would answer the call. And if there are those who are here listening, watching this, that feel like I'm not awakened, I don't know what it's like to be enlisted in this war, How, how can I get in? How can I get involved? Put me in, coach. I want to just encourage you, let you know that from the very beginning, from your beginning, which did not start with your mom and your dad, you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. All you simply have to do is to acknowledge that yes, God sent his son Jesus, his sinless son who died upon the cross with the the sin of humanity, including your sin upon him. 
All you must do is acknowledge that you are in need of a Savior. And yes, I, I not only believe, but I, I surrender my life to you. If you said that prayer, I encourage you to click on that link right there in the comments. We'd love to pray with you even further to help you understand what that means. Family, I encourage you, like, let's not just approach this as just another series, another message. Like, we, don't, we don't need another season of mediocrity. Let's be, like, do you know what mediocrity does to the Lord Jesus? Do you know what lukewarmness does to him? <clears throat> He'd rather spit you out and vomit it. He regurgitates it. It's of no use to him. Our lukewarmness is of no use to him and the battle. I pray that we would be awakened to this cosmic conflict and that we would be on fire for the Lord Jesus, the God of war. Amen. God bless you. All right, family, and then there is so many announcements that we have, um, different things that are taking place at our church um, that we're always doing. So I encourage you to go to DetroitChurch.com and you can look at our trending section and you can see some of the things that happen on the regular here at Detroit Church. Um, but I want to put something on your radar. Um, we're, we're calling for like an impromptu service, right, that will take place on Tuesday. We're, we're calling for supercharged. We're going to call it supercharged. And in this, in this experience, we're trusting God to take our natural and to put his super on it. So I want you to come out Tuesday at 7. Now this is our RSVP, right? We need you to RSVP. Make sure you click the link and you RSVP. Bring your mask. We will be following social distancing regulations, so make sure you bring your mask. Come ready. But we're expecting God to do some crazy things in our lives on this coming Tuesday, and we would love for you to be a part of it. And then, of course, Wednesday at 6.30 a.m., we will be praying every Wednesday at 6.30 a.m. We're praying together, so we encourage you to go to our Zoom channel on Wednesdays at 6.30 a.m. Other than that, family, meet us here at 10 a.m. right back here next week on YouTube and Facebook where we'll be continuing this series. Um, so I want you to make sure you get ready because we're about to have a good time.